The Brown Institute for Media Innovation is delighted to welcome you to the kickoff event of our 2018-2019 speaker series. I'm Ann Grimes. I co-direct the Brown Institute with Manish Agrawala, professor in computer science. And we are delighted to welcome you. We're happy you could join us today uh, in what promises to be a interesting conversation. How many of you know about the Brown Institute? OK. Some, but not all. For those of you who don't, Brown is a bicoastal institute anchored here at Stanford in the School of Engineering and in New York at Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. The institute was started five years ago thanks to an endowment set up by Helen Gurley Brown, the longtime editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine. Uh, in honor of her husband, David Brown, who was a producer, he produced Jaws and Driving Miss Daisy, and he was a uh, graduate both of Stanford and of Columbia. The mission of the Institute is to innovate at the intersection of media and technology. To that end, we bring together students from both coasts to work on projects that create new forms of storytelling, new forms of media, and tools to gather, develop, and distribute news and information in new ways. Early every year, we fund about a dozen projects that drive innovation in media and technology. We call them magic grants because, as Ms. Brown once said, when you, happen, when you bring together media journalists and technology, magic can happen. If you are interested in hearing more about our call for proposals, more about the Institute, our workshops, classes, and upcoming events, our next talks will be here on November 13th, 4.30 p.m., same time, same place, with New York Times graphic editor Kevin Queeley. Please add your name to the mailing list that has, is being circulated around so we can, we can keep you updated. Today we are delighted to welcome Simon Rogers. Simon is an award-winning data journalist, writer, and speaker. He is the author of Facts Are Sacred, The Power of Data, Simon also serves as data editor on Google News Lab's team. He directs the Data Journalism Awards and teaches, teaches data journalism at the San Francisco campus of Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Over the years, Simon has been involved in a range of award-winning data projects, including Google's Year in Search and Election Land, which monitored in real time voting issues that surfaced during the 2016 election. Earlier, Simon served as Twitter's first data editor, working to tell stories from billions of tweets. He has been a news editor at The Guardian, where he worked with the graphics team to visualize and interpret large data sets. In 2011, Simon was named the best UK internet journalist by Oxford University's Internet Institute. In 2012, he received the Royal Statistical Society's Award for Statistical Excellence in Online Journalism. Today, Simon will tell us how he learned to love data journalism. Please join me in welcoming Simon Rogers. Thank you, man. That's really sweet. And thank you so much for having me here. It's so nice to be down at Stanford. But normally, I'm in San Francisco. It's a little bit chilly. Um, can you hear my phone? Um, yes. Okay, keep talking. I'll hold okay. Seat. Can you hear me? Okay. Good. So I am just going to uh, talk through a little bit about what I do. Like perhaps many of you will discover in the future, I do a job that my parents don't really understand what I do. Okay, so it's actually off being the case of almost all of my jobs. I should point out. Um, um, and kind of really how I started, to, how I got into it, and how I feel data journalism is developing, is developing now. So this is me um, when I was seven, and um, this is actually when I first started doing this. I did this for my son, and because he was kind of around the same age, and he thought it was hilarious that I was wearing a tie. But this was the 1970s in England, so uh, it was me age seven. There were things that I liked doing very much when I was seven. I liked, uh, I liked, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I liked taking things apart. Our house was full of things that I'd taken apart, normally clocks and electrical devices. Um, and I wanted to write. I really liked writing. The thing that I really didn't enjoy was maths. Um, 
And uh, it, was, uh, it was throughout my childhood, maths was a real issue for me. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't see how it was relevant. I was, I was keen to get, into, get out of having to do it at all. My ideal thing would have been that I had to do no maths whatsoever. And I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a reporter. In fact, my maths teacher at school uh, put this in my report. Tries hard but has little natural ability, which is pretty, pretty much, uh, pretty much, uh, that's actually uh, kind of followed me through my, throughout my career really a bit. Um, and yeah, here I am. I worked at, I worked at the, the Guardian uh, for a while. I, when I first joined the Guardian, it was 1998. I was the editor, the news editor of something called Guardian Unlimited, which was the Guardian's first website. And it was a network of websites, Guardian Limited, and you see, it had all these blocks on the front. And that was it. That was all the content on the front page were these blocks, and they would take you off to other pages. Um, the one that says news was my block, and that would go off to a news front page. That was the first, the first um, proper Guardian website. Uh, I was there. I went to the paper. Um, in fact, I joined the paper on uh, September the 10th, 2001. That was my first day as a news editor on the on the paper and in fact the next day when everything started happening everybody was out to lunch except me I was the only I was the only editor on on, on deck when that happened um, thankfully people came back I was very pleased about that um, I set up something called the Guardian data blog which was the first kind of news website blog certainly in the UK about data and um, let me write this book called facts are sacred which you can you can still get the online version I think is actually a little bit better than the the printed one because you can do stuff you can see videos of, of, of the stuff we do and then as Anne said I'll, I end up at Twitter as the first data editor and now work at the Google News Lab um, where I am data editor so for somebody who didn't like maths at school somehow <laughs> what I do is involved a lot of maths and numbers and data so I'm going to talk a little bit about that so what is the Google News Lab Google News Lab is this global team within Google it's kind of like an editorial bridge for the company with the news industry a lot of the people that work on the team are journalists, have been journalists, understand the news industry very well. And the idea is for us to be a voice, not only f out there in the world, but also inside the company. It's a huge company now, Google. So having people inside who understand the news industry and how it works is really important. Um, we do lots of different stuff as ecosystem partnerships. We work with, with organizations and we do training where we have people that go out into the newsroom and train people how to do Google tools. And we also have this kind of Newsroom innovation mission, which is a lot of the stuff that I work in around data journalism, increasingly kind of other weird types of, of work involving weird types of technology that, that Google has. And it's all with a focus on editorial and newsrooms. You know, we don't have to, nobody on our team sells anything, nobody does anything involving money. It's kind of, it's kind of great, it's very freeing actually to, to be in that position. So I get asked this quite a lot. Um, why does Google employ a data journalist? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and I'll talk a little bit first about how I get into it and how I understand what data is. So um, when I was a kid, um, this, is, this, this was the news industry for me. We, cons we consume news as newspapers. We were very much a newspaper house. On Monday to Saturday we got The Guardian and on Sundays we got The Observer. There was always newspaper strewn out throughout, throughout our house and that's, that's what I grew up with. I also grew up with, um, with this guy. Does anybody know who this is? Who the illustrator is? Okay, for those of you, I hope everybody knows this, Richard Scarry. Um, I grew up loving Richard Scarry, literally my favorite author still. Actually, I've, I've, all my kids have been kind of, have had me obsessing about Richard Scarry to them as well. Um, a lot of Richard Scarry is about what people do. And journalism is weirdly kind of sewn throughout a lot of Richard Scarry's work, a lot of kind of busy town stuff. Newspaper editor looks very cool. Newspaper portal looks better because you get a carrot pen. You get to run around with your hat kind of flying off. The idea, I love, I love that idea of kind of, you know, this being a part of everyday life. Also, one of the best things about Richard Scarry is he spends a lot of time explaining how things work. So, for instance, this is my, one of my favourite of his illustrations, showing how, how a big ship works. And okay, it's like cartoony and, you know, it's for entertainment purposes, but it's entirely accurate. This is the amazing thing about it. The fact that it's not done in a kind of draftsman-like way, it doesn't really matter. Explain, you can understand how a motor works from looking at the way that, um, that Richard Scarry illustrates. And for me, that's really, really important. And I thought about this a lot when um, uh, recently we did a series of books for kids. And when I started, when I did the work on this, I did the, basically the editing and, and data research work for these and work with these amazing uh, kind of illustrators. And when we started doing it, I thought, well, this will be a bit of fun. 
and you know it's it's kind of it's an extra job it was kind of kind of a good thing to do i like having things on the go i like being busy um but uh, i've realized that actually there's something really interesting about these books and partly it's because my kids finally understand what i do when they see these books and partly because children really love certainty in this world the world's very nuanced very gray what's going on what's happening especially at the moment when there's so much you know, awful stuff happening in the world, actually be able to understand facts about things provides a sense of certainty. And there's kind of something amazing about that, amazing and kind of reassuring in a way, knowing how fast an a alligator can run or whatever, or how many bones are in a dog. It helps you give you a sense of certainty about the world. And there's this as well, that we, we, we're engaged by pictures long before we learn to read. We, we react to imagery in a way that we just don't react to, to numbers or words when they're, they're told to us. Sometimes those images can, can change the world. They can make a real difference in how we understand the world around us. And the best kind of visual data journalism does, does that, changes the world and kind of helps us understand how it works just a little bit better. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Some people might have seen me talk about this before, but I still think it's really illustrative. So this is the first ever Manchester Guardian from May the 5th, 1821, when well, I was working at The Guardian, when they, um, they were moving offices and um, they were chucking everything away, literally everything away, you know, like newspapers do when they move offices, they throw everything away. And behind my desk, I found this big rolled up, high quality, kind of glossy reproduction of somebody had done of the first ever Guardian. So of course I stole it, it's on my wall at home, and this is how I spotted this. But anyway, um, so this is the, the back page of the first ever garden. There's only, there's only one sheet folded over. Front page is all adverts because, you know, adverts, money. And the, and the, 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 advert, the first advert on the front page for a lost black Labrador. Anyway, <laughs> on the back is all the new stuff. This is all the new stories. And here we are, bang in the middle is a big table of data. And that table of data is a list of schools in Manchester and how many pupils were there, how much money they cost and so on. Now, this would be super uncontroversial, literally, it's the easiest public data to get hold of, probably. But in 1821, 60 years before education was compulsory in the UK, kids learnt to read and write, unless they're rich, of course, they, they learnt to read and write in Sunday school. That, that, was, that was where Sunday school started, as ways to teach, teach kids whose parents couldn't afford to, for them not to work. So it was incredibly political. The data was actually leaked to The Guardian, um, by somebody, and uh, this was the, the line they used in the paper. At all times, such information contains is valuable because without knowing the best opinions which can be formed of the condition and future progress of society must be necessarily incorrect. I tell that to me that unless we know what's going on in the world, we can't improve anything. We can't understand anything properly. And journalism has always been about understanding things properly, right? Understanding the world in a better way. So that's where kind of day journalism comes about. So I've done some kind of rules of data journalism in those field that that's notoriously has no rules. Um, but the first thing, and I, I've said this for a while, and I still believe that it's true, that anybody can, that can do data journalism. It's incredibly easy. This is uh, from a, a punk fanzine from 1976. This is a core, this is another, this is a third, now form a band, which is pretty much what punk was all about. Um, and there's a kind of data journalism version of this which essentially is based on the fact that data is everywhere now. Data sets are plentiful, tools are free and out there. Becoming a data journalist is actually not the hardest thing in the world. You actually have somebody in this room as well who set up a data journalism organisation from having no expertise in this area and created one of the most important data journalism organisations anywhere in the world. So to me, that proves that literally it's a field that, that people can get involved in. Data journalism has become very mainstream now. It's become very, very common. Um, we did a survey. Uh, we looked at newsrooms all over the world. 51% of all newsrooms now have a dedicated data journalist. It's a global phenomenon. 60% of digital newsrooms have a dedicated data journalist. The days when it was kind of a few people and it was a few isolated people have really, have really gone. Data Journalism Awards, which I'm director of, had record number of entries this year. Um, it was actually 680 um, by the time we got them all in. They were from 300 odd news organisations, but from all over the world. 51% of them were from small newsrooms. We had entries from Afghanistan, from Egypt, you know, countries that are not known for having access to incredible kind of resources. And we saw a lot of this in the winners. You know, you had the Wall Street Journal, but also you had some entries from Serbia and from 
uh, Peru and um, Brazil and, it, and Ukraine. It's, it was kind of incredibly kind of empowering to see all these entries come in and things that, that are difficult to do being done all over the world by all kinds of people, all kinds of skill levels. It's, it's an incredibly powerful thing. And partly because the tools that we have access to are getting way, way better. There was a time when these were the kind of visualizations that it was possible to make, right? This was an online visualization. Um, although I'm finding now people increasingly don't know who this was. So I'm, for anybody who doesn't, I'm sorry, you just have to look them up. Um, but now you can use the tools that are out there to do anything. This is something I made, I don't know if you can really see it with the lights, but this shows tweets around uh, sunrise as the sun is rising. It's an incredibly easy thing to do if you have access to something called Carto, which is a free tool. Anybody can use that. Um, the guy who made this, which is um, the Earth wind map, and it's worth checking out whenever there's a hurricane, it just works. It just works constantly. It's worked constantly for like five years now. And you go and there's a hurricane or something, you can go and you can see the hurricane on this map. Person, this person had no coding skills when they decided to build this. They literally taught themselves everything and, and built this map. And it's incredibly powerful, it's beautiful, but you, it's, the idea, this barriers of entry have kind of really, have really dropped. Someone like John Byrne Murdoch works at the FT now. Um, he used to be um, one of my interns. He's now taught himself to become a visual journalist, a visual journalist who builds sophisticated, coded visualizations, having taught himself how to do it. So this, this idea of, of kind of journalism being kind of sophisticated and difficult thing for people to do, it's, it's not also true. But as a result, a lot of data journalists feel quite isolated. I think it's fair to say if they're often they, they're kind of on their own organizations. When a data editor leaves, um, and this isn't about me, this is, uh, this is uh, often, often the case, data editor leaves an organization, they really don't know how to be replaced. Like they, if, you, if, the, if the, you know, the, 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 the national news editor left or the metro editor left, Everybody would know how to replace that person. Data journalists, it's not so simple because people don't know, you know, the skill sets are very kind of often contained within that person. There are, there are solutions to that. This is the Data Journalism Handbook, for instance, is an example of that. We've actually, this was published in 2011. It's the Bible of Data Journalism, free to, uh, to download. It's had over a million downloads now. We're, gonna, we're funding a new version, which is going to come out um, in December online. And just to, to update from 2011, because things have changed a little bit. But the idea, there's, there's, I've really noticed, and I'll talk about, a bit about this later on, data journalists tend to be collegiate in a way that often other journalists aren't necessarily. They like collaborating, they like working together, and they like, uh, because, often because they are kind of like on their own where they are. Um, it's not about being a coder necessarily, as I said, but it can help. But there are now lots of tools that are, are kind of support you in that way. This is a tool called Flourish. And Flourish was built by um, these two uh, former Guardian developers in London called Kiln. And the idea of Flourish is that anybody can upload a visualization to it and then reuse it. Because traditionally what happens is the developer in user will build a visualization and you kind of want to use it again, maybe with a different color, a different heading, different data. And nobody wants to remake the same visualization again. You can't get anybody to do it. So the idea of Flourish is really to add a ton of templates and keep adding new templates to it to allow anybody to make any kind of visualization without being a coder. All you have to have is the data. There's also uh, this tool. This is called Tilegrams. So we built this. Uh, it was a bit of a hack. And it was really around the 2016 election. We noticed that cartograms were getting more popular. We know what a cartogram is. So kind of maps that don't look like traditional maps. So you can see Rhode Island. You can see DC. And um, this is a GitHub tool, the, and part of the, inf the inf reason for doing it is we were told that on 538 they were, they were literally drawing their cartograms using um, Illustrator, which seemed like as a daily task seemed, seemed a bit bonkers. So anyway, you, anybody who uses Tilegrams, you can download it as a SVG file, or you can download it as a, as a, um, a, a top adjacent to, to, to use an interactive. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the data that we work with. Because one of the things that we've seen is that we all have access to data sets which are much, much bigger than they used to be. Data is getting bigger and bigger all the time. And so um, because tech companies are all about data, right? it's the exhaust of the way we live from you know, every time we search, every time we tweet anything, when we text, everything is, is data now. So there's the access data we have access to has got bigger and bigger. So I'm going to talk about a data set that I know about most, which is Google Trends data, give you a sense of what that's about. So, it's very, very big. Most obvious thing to say, there's billions of searches every day. Um, I made this map in Carto 
And on the map, basically it's full of dots, and the dots are towns that, where there's data for. So you notice there are some places where there isn't any data. And that's because either because we're banned or because nobody lives there. So you've got the, you know, the, uh, the deserts and stuff, but in China, obviously, um, there's no official Google. So, um, but what I did then is I took the map away, the background maps. It's literally just made up of the dots that show kind of how we live. There's ubiquity to search data, which kind of takes it beyond this kind of echo chamber social media because it's something we all do. Um, and you can really get a sense of kind of natural contours of places through the, through the, the, the way that we search. The other thing to say about data is it's incredibly honest. Um, you're never as honest as you are with your search engine. It's not like you know, maybe when you post something on social media and you're, you're portraying yourself in a certain way. Search data is incredibly, it's incredibly honest. So for instance, this is something I pulled last night. This is searches for gun control uh, versus gun shop. So the idea of controlling guns versus buying them. This is the average of 2018. Um, it would be interesting to, to uh, you know, line this up with um, election results, but not always, but anyway, but there is, some of these states are not necessarily a surprise. What I thought was interesting, I, I pulled this again last night uh, for over the weekend because of um, over the weekend. This is how it looked last night. More people, so more places where people search for how to buy guns is higher than how to control them. Which is interesting because there wasn't really a debate after Pittsburgh about gun control in the way there was after other shootings. It was almost like it moved on to being about something else. Anyway, uh, there's an honesty to the data which sometimes can be really, can make you a bit sad. <laughs> um, sometimes it can tell you something else about the world. This, e these are searches for croissants versus donuts. Can anybody guess which colour is which? Yeah, <laughs> I think red is donuts because um, it's France, but it's uh, North Africa. Um, so the, the data is incredibly, and it's just kind of, there's, that honesty to it is really refreshing in a way because it tells you what the world's thinking about. It also tells you how eclectic uh, the world is. You can use it to look at the way the attitudes have changed. For instance, something we did with the Washington Post, where they wanted to try and get at people's attitudes towards same-sex marriage over time through the way that people search. So we pulled all the top searches around same-sex marriage every year in every state um, uh, for this period. And what you can see is, and they kind of categorise them into the neutral ones, which are kind of informational, people asking where you can get a licence and so on. And then anti ones, people are kind of against gay marriage. Um, and, then, and then positive ones, which were in favour of gay marriage. And what you can see is really how much more relaxed people have kind of got through the way they search that really this bottom map shows people are just searching for information. That's increasingly what happens as society changes. You can get at some of that through the, the kind of things people search for. But then you can also look at how people search around after a football game. So I think this is world searches for, for players uh, during the World Cup. I think it was in the last day. Um, Mbappe, amazing player. And then in England, uh, still he was the most searched player because th there was this slight risk that England might actually make it to the final. We also have access to other data as well, which is kind of other, almost unintentional data. So when you, um, when you go somewhere, in Google you have a choice, right? When you get one of these, you get a choice whether to have your location switched on or off. If you keep it on, there's some interesting analysis we can do, although we get it very kind of anonymized. I couldn't tell you where any individuals have been, but one piece, and this is very hard data to get, even in, internally we had to go through a lot of hoops for it. Um, but one of the interesting things we did was looked at visits to restaurants. It's a really simple thing. Yeah, everybody goes to a restaurant and have a phone in the pocket, maybe on the table if you're bad. Um, and, we, and so we looked at visits to restaurants uh, data, and then you can see this kind of map of kind of the cultural differences between how people, you know, where people go to pizza restaurants compared to Mexican restaurants, compared to coffee bars or Italian restaurants or sandwich bars and so on. It's kind of a really interesting piece. I'd love to be able to do more with this, and hopefully we'll get, we'll get access to it as we go on. The other thing about the data, which I wasn't expecting so much, is how immediate it is. And that as soon as something happens, it's reflected in the way that we search, which is an obvious thing that kind of we all do that when we hear about something, we go and start searching for it. This is a visual that we did um, after the Paris attacks. And we wanted to show how quickly it kind of the search interest, elevated search interest spread around the world. And the minutes that it took for, to get from Paris to Berlin to London to New York to Sydney, 
you know, the, the story travels around the world fast, or news travels around the world fast, and I think, I, I like to believe, and I, th I think this is borne out by the data, that the way people search is an effort to find out what's actually happening. Not always just to get reinforced in what they think is happening, but to actually find out what's happening. So we're going to talk about, and bearing that in mind, the lead segues onto the idea about elections. And obviously we are a week away from uh, these incredibly important um, midterm elections. I'm going to talk a little bit at first about what we did in 2016, and then I'll talk about what we're doing, what we're doing now. So um, one of the things that uh, we find often in the data is that weird stuff shows up that we weren't expecting. So for instance, the phrase move to Canada. So we, 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 I'm sorry to say we invented that. We, did, well, we didn't mean to, we were just looking at thing, weird things that were spiking um, on Super Tuesday and uh, the phrase move to Canada turned up. But there is other more sophisticated work we do. We often look for what we call related searches. So people search for one thing, what else do they search for? So we did this during the Republican primary in uh, 2016 when we were looking at if somebody searched for one of the candidates, what order were the other candidates searched for? We were trying to get some sense of where their interest might go when that person drops out. And so our teams have also done some other work looking at that in a bit more depth. So for instance, this was done before the 2016 election. People that search for Ted Cruz tend to search for the oil industry and guns and Chevy trucks, none of which is a massive surprise, really. You kind of might expect that. People search for Donald Trump, however, search for kids' activities and minivans and gaming consoles, which suggests that sub suburban parents, as we know, were kind of the crucial, the crucial vote in that election. It's interesting to see that there's a kind of link there in the way that people search. We also um, looked at other stuff too, and I, I, I must do a bit more of this actually in the next week or so, but looked at the TV shows that people search for, they search different candidates. So um, uh, obviously a lot of, with Donald Trump, there's a lot of uh, reality shows going on there. Um, and with Henry Clinton, it was uh, a little bit, a little bit different. There's kind of, and it tells you something interesting. We want to look at shopping habits as well. Uh, you know, people who look for one do something else as well. We've also uh, worked a lot on how to bring this data to life in a kind of live environment. So Google was, um, did the, the uh, press spin rooms at five of the Republican debates during the, the primary season. And if anybody's ever been to a spin room, normally they're pretty depressing places. They're normally gyms, uh, that have, and you get a trestle table, cold coffee, and some and packets of chips around, that's it. Uh, what Google kind of Googled it up, which is why it's so swanky. But we also had all this real-time data. You can see this big screen there um, with live data in real time showing what was going on. We were trying really to make the data useful. This room is going to be full of journalists who've got nothing to do for like eight hours and then suddenly a burst of activity at the end. So we wanted to fill that time with kind of useful information. It kind of became a bit of a backdrop um, to the campaign. Uh, and and we, we actually had a lot of retweets. Uh, but we also tried to surface other data too. So this is YouTube viewing data in the months leading up to election day, um, looking at the most viewed official videos by Trump versus Hillary. So you can see obviously the colors are obvious, red and blue. What we started to notice though was this started to happen near the end. <coughs> Anybody notice anything about those particular states? So we've got Pennsylvania, Florida. These are, these are crucial states. And it was, it was incredibly interesting. So we could see this happening. In, in YouTube views in the, in the week before, before um, the vote. So next Tuesday, 1,200 plus candidates, 500 elections. It's, it's interesting because in some ways it's like, for us, it's like 2016, but it's very different. It's essentially 500 local elections, very local stories. So what could we do that's gonna be useful kind of around those stories? And it felt to me like a lot of the work is about that helping people report at a very local level. So uh, for instance, we've got this site now, Google Trends Midterms 2018, um, that's active now. We have a page for every state. All 50 states have a page, nice cartogram on the front. And when you go through to those pages, you've got real-time updating algorithm-driven charts, which are all embeddable and, you can, and they're all shareable and so on. And they really go into depth on the, the issues that are being searched for in each state by count, at a county level. We've also done a lot of work on trying to provide other kinds of data as well. So for instance, one of the things that we were interested in trying to get hold of was congressional district data. Now that's really difficult inside Google because it's not like a recognized border system. 
that Google can pull data for. So we worked with a geographer at Sheffield University called Alistair Ray. And um, what we've done is he's aggregated city data to congressional districts for us. So we can actually now rank the issues that are being searched at district level. Philip Bump used, has used it to look at where the healthcare has become the kind of this huge issue of the election. We've also got these kind of county level maps, which we've really just been pumping out day by day so they're useful. These are searches for healthcare versus immigration. Now, healthcare has been and is still the top searched issue around the country consistently for the last few weeks. There are points when immigration goes above it, and that's you know, during the travel ban, first travel ban, the family separations at the end of the, uh, the recently family separations. Those are the points where immigration kind of dips above, above healthcare, but healthcare is consistently a top issue in the way that people search. Uh, we also look at kind of questions and phrases. Um, these are the, we looked at these questions. These are the que top questions about children, just children, the word children. It's within 24 hours around the time that story broke. Um, and it was all around these, uh, these separations. <coughs> and also questions around voting at a very kind of local level, give you a sense of what people are asking for. One of the things we looked at yesterday was um, we were looking at, we were trying to get at people searching for where to vote, like their polling place. And we found there's, there are regional differences in people searching for my polling place versus how do I vote. In some states, people search for how do I vote. And, we, and that's actually what states where you've got postal voting. People are searching for how to vote because they actually don't know how to necessarily. And we've got other stuff too. This, these are searches for early voting. This was this week. Um, and it's search interest, essentially. So everything's normalized. So that's how you can compare little places to big places. And look at Texas there, which is really lit up in search for early voting. That's this week. And lots of states doing early voting now. So it's interesting that it happens to be. This is the county of Oregon. This one up here. Yeah, I know. It's interesting, isn't it? See, I don't know. See, half the time we look at it and people say to us, like, so why does that happen? I said, that's really your job to find out why that happened. But no, it's really interesting, isn't it? And so weird things happen like that all the time. And so, so you have these consistent things like healthcare being top search, but then these weird things that pop up because there's a local reason for that happening. We, um, we're interested very much in kind of finding more data. So this is the election data bot, which we built with ProPublica. And basically, there is data on here for every single... Uh, congressional election. So every single House race, every Senate race, every candidate, all of the candidates are all on here. And it's a combination of FEC spending data. And Derek Willis turns out is like, everybody who knows him knows that he is the god of, of scraping. He scrapes FEC data faster than Google's search stuff scrapes it. It's kind of amazing. So there's daily FEC data in there. We've got Google Trends. We've got deleted tweets by candidates. We've got Facebook ad postings and press statements by candidates as well. It's all in there. So the idea is really to give people like a superpower. You're reporting on this election in Kentucky's second district. You've no idea about anything about this place. This would be a really good place to start. Um, we're also doing a lot of work kind of globally. Uh, we've, we've got a team now. I've got, I've got uh, members of my team who are in Brazil, and since they've just had an election. Uh, we will, what we'll do is often when we're working on these elections around the world, we'll work with an interactive designer in each country so we're not producing stuff from the state. So this was produced by a Brazilian designer. Um, in France, we worked with a group called We Do Data, which is a kind of local data kind of collective, amazing, um, around their election. And they were very, and everybody has a very different, kind of slightly different take on it. So in France, it was looking at issues and candidates. So what if people search for Macron, which issue would they search for, for instance? In Germany, we worked with Moritz Stefana, who is just this amazing designer. And one thing he wanted to look at was word clouds. So word clouds are the mullets of data visualization. Everybody who knows about design hates word clouds. So Moritz took that as a challenge and has now kind of delved into a way to use word clouds to represent search interests, which is kind of a cool and, and of course, it in a beautiful way. Um, we also have uh, had this in Mexico. There's a lot of elections happened this year. So in each place, we're trying to find data which really kind of reflects each country and is, is kind of useful and unique in that place. Um, there are certain things that work well in other places and, and work better in some places than others. But the idea is really to kind of just open up this data set. It's the world's biggest journalistic data set, I'm confident to say, that we're sitting on. Um, and it's getting bigger every single day. So how can we make that easier and more uh, and easier to work around? So I mentioned, um, we'll talk a little bit now about 
back to more data journalism about collaboration. Collaboration really is is a kind of a hallmark of, of the work data journalists do. Cheryl's obviously involved in a lot of collaborative projects. It's, it's one of the interesting things about data journalism that um, it encourages people to work together, partly because people are isolated on their own. So all, everybody kind of knows, they all know each other. Um, and part of that collaboration comes because of the fact your work is stronger when you, when you work with other people. This is something I made this uh, years ago. I still use this because it kind of illustrates for me a lot of the issues. So I made this map about poverty in London. And um, I thought it was kind of cool because it had all these different areas and um, this kind of freaky color range. And basically, so red was very poor, blue was rich. Um, or green was rich, so I'm confused already. Anyway, I put this together. I thought it was great. And then um, uh, somebody tweeted, uh, Gregor Eich, who's a, who works in your time, tweeted, uh, your map is a fail. Well, so my first reaction to that was, piss off, how dare you? I spent hours working on that. Um, but actually, and I said, well, what would you do in a kind of snarky way? And we had like this two hour debate via Twitter about color ranges and things like color brewer, but which by the way is still the best way to get color differences. And the reason we talked about it is so we know what, what's the problem with that map. There's, a, there's, a, there's one thing which is really bad about that map besides the fact it looks like somebody's thrown up. Sorry? Balconics, I read the book. Hmm? Balconic people? Colorblind, yeah, exactly. Um, really bad if you're colorblind. So basically, the, the point we kind of did, did this, had this massive debate, and we ended up with a color range which wasn't, which anybody could see, even if you were colorblind. And, um, and that was because of the way stuff works now. I think in the past, you know, journalism was all about sitting in your ivory tower, throwing out your words of wisdom to the world and be gratefully received, and, um, and, and you would be declared a hero all round. And that, those days are well gone. Now, you know, journalism is much more collaborative now, it has to be has to reflect the way, that, the way that we work in the world. And there are a lot of projects there. So for instance, Election Land, which is a project that uh, we worked on and we're gonna be working on again in a week's time. We'll, we'll be sitting in a, a room in CUNY with 150 reporters. Um, it, it was, the Election Land 2016 was the world's biggest single day collaborative journalistic project. It was a thousand, over a thousand reporters were involved. And the idea was to monitor um, in real time uh, issues around voting things that stopped people voting, like long wait times or provisional ballots or voter intimidation or voting machine problems. Um, this is actually election day in that, in that data was kind of recurring. You can relive election day again and again if you want to um, with this GIF. And the idea was that this data would be like a tip off in the way that somebody would ring up. They had a t uh, helpline, people would ring up and, and they would have local reports saying, oh, well, we've heard about this. And we would use the data then to back it up. So well, actually it's interesting because there's a spike in search data there. We're going to be doing this again um, next Tuesday in New York. We're also going to do a, a slightly happier map, which is going to be people searching for how do I vote, where do I vote, where's my polling place, kind of things about voting. Um, but the idea was to really kind of, rather than every polling day, what normally happens is all day reporters wander around trying to find out what's going on where. And the idea was that we would be able to tell them, and that's what we want to do again. Um, as another project which we've supported I'm really proud to work on his documentary, Hate. Similar kind of idea. The idea was to apply the election land model to reporting on hate crimes. There's all this anecdotal evidence hate crimes on the rise. Obviously, we've had a massive reminder of that um, this week. And the idea of documenting hate was to try and bring some data to that, because the national data around reporting hate crimes is pretty crap. So, um, and that, and really there is kind of, there are several inputs into that. There are people can report issues they've heard about. People can, um, there are tip-off lines, this sort of thing. Um, one of the things we thought was, what can we do that's useful? So we came up with the, uh, the Documenting Hate News Index. It still works, there's a, there's a little bit of bug today. Not working great today, but it will be by tomorrow. And we thought, well, what have we got access to? And trends data actually isn't that useful here, but maybe we've got other data that is. So what we do have is access to Google News data. So when you, when you use Google News, what you get are the most trusted sources. So it tends to be the biggest sources, like the New York Times and so on. But actually what we wanted to gather were the, the smallest sources. We wanted the local news outlets in the middle of the Midwest that aren't, just aren't going to show up um, if you go to, to Google News properly. So we, what we do is internally we scrape every story that's categorized as being about, about um, hate crime. And then we ran through the, through the uh, Google Cloud Natural Language API to 
to cut, categorize all of those stories further, to try and give us details about place, about location. Um, it gave us a lot. This is actually the first machine learning, artificial intelligence thing I've ever done. It gave us lots of hints about what works and what doesn't work. For instance, um, somebody had written that Caitlyn Jenner's MAGA hat was a hat crime. And, um, and the algorithm that assumed somebody had mistyped that, and that was actually a hate crime story. Things like that, that you know, computers are stupid, as we know. So um, things like where, where obviously you have the human ability to train algorithm is really important. Yeah? It's, it's really helped us kind of work on, um, work on that. Um, another really important characteristic around data journalism is, is being open, openness and transparency. It's really, really important. Um, there's a whole community out there of people taking data and making it more available. The work that Lanassion's done, I'm sorry, okay. the work that Lanassion's done in opening up data in a country which, you know, where there's no tradition of openness and transparency, is there, um, is incredible. And making it available to people, making it understandable for people, the work that the local news project's doing, it's all incredibly powerful work to open up the data that's there and make it easier for people to use and access. And even these mainstream outlets who are uh, often, you know, one of my arguments about a lot of data now is a lot of it is about proving how clever you are. Even so, people who, who prove how clever are also put a lot of data um, in open data formats online. It's really important because it makes your work better if you can share it around, if you can be transparent around the, the data and numbers that are there. Um, and uh, we do as well, we have a GitHub page, I'll have a slide with that. Um, because it's important even for us to kind of open up Google Trends data and you know, reveal the process that we do before we do an interactive or we, or we produce something. So I'm going to talk a little bit also about process and how that works and how the process works for me. Um, this is something actually we made this when I was at The Guardian. I kind of just read it a bit recently because a lot of the techniques and things are still kind of pretty opposite, I think. So this is, how, this is how I work. It's not how everybody works, but I just want to kind of show you, show you a little bit of that. So you kind of start, tend to start off with, I often get asked, like, so do you just start off with all this data? Do you kind of like plow and data like you're swimming in data or something? I never start like that. I tend to start with an idea or a theory or there's something's happened, and that gives me a way to start. And I think knowing what you're looking for is a really, is a really good way to go in to data. It obviously exposes a bias on your part, but any idea that journalists have no biases is, I think, totally false. And, and data journalists are just the same as everybody else. But I think having some idea of what you're going to is really important. It can make going through a data a lot easier. Also, there are recurring events, maybe it's breaking news, you have a theory, or you just got a data set and you want to, you want to kind of show some stuff around it. Um, a lot of data journalism is incredibly simple in actually what it's doing. The methodology might be complex, but actually what you're showing can often be incredibly simple around wanting to compare or show change. It's something bigger than it used to be. What's the data actually mean? Where's this data from? How does it compare to somewhere else? What other data sets can you bring together to kind of mash up? A lot of those things recur again and again in a lot of, in a lot of the way that data journalism works. And then this, this bit, which I would say takes up 80% of the time. So 80% of the work is kind of boring. Very important to note that. Um, data is often in the wrong format. You can have spreadsheets from government sources that merge cells. PDFs, PDFs where data goes to die. Still, still an issue. I was talking to uh, a reporter in New Jersey so who was saying that they get official data from local sources, handwritten, handwritten data, which is insane to me, but it still happens now, even in 2018. So when you've got all of that, and then performing the calculations on the data, Reperforming them again because something's wrong, often. Sanity checking, like understanding, knowing that something just seems wrong is really, really important. And partly that comes out of knowing maybe how many people are in the world or what population size is or roughly what GDP is to give you a sense of that just doesn't seem right. And checking it again, not believing it. I think the journalists tend to see data as this kind of infallible thing, and it's not. People make mistakes when they're compiling data all the time, and you have to be aware of that. But at the end of it is this kind of output, and output is very much kind of computer science term, really. But the idea of, of, of output, and it can be anything, and that's the most amazing thing about the field, is that it really, at the end of the day, you can be producing content in so many different ways. Is it an interactive? Is it a story? Is, there, is it just the number that's interesting? Is it now a social media post? Is that it? Is it a thread? 
all of those things are really are really powerful and and part of for me that's part of the attraction that every day you're doing something that's that's a little bit different and there's our github page that slide's plainly in the wrong place but we have a github page that's the url that's where you can download some of our data um i talked a little bit about design and i usually say design matter because design is getting more and more sophisticated and if you're not a coder how can you do things that look like they're designed properly and actually the reason for including design this is different now and the reason is because as i referred to earlier we consume news in different ways now you know we've gone from you know when i was first working at the guardian we used to do these uh, as well as doing the, the data editor job we used to do these amazing center spreads where the whole spread would be a giant graphic and if you work at the new york times and some local outlets you can still do that but for a lot of people that's not how they consume news now there are a lot of countries in the world where that tipping point has been reached where over half of half of the population the way they consume news isn't is not on a desktop anymore it's not on a big screen um where people consume news has obviously changed this middle one really doesn't surprise me um actually news via smartphone in the bathroom or on the toilet this is all from reuters study this isn't me making up by the way this is actual this is actual data and that totally uh reinforces what i thought would be the case so we thought a lot about this and the way the way we're thinking about this is really this idea of kind of visuals at work in a kind of mobile first environment so a lot of the we have um a project for this so we have a budget for data visualization a lot of companies have budgets for data visualizations and often what they use is kind of as a marketing thing you make a cool visit it makes you look cool so we thought well we've got this money so what we should do with it is try and use it for good so i e we'll, we'll go to designers and we'll say you can do whatever you want all the only restriction we have is it's got to be mobile first it's got to be innovative and it's got to be open source so everything you do we have to publish the code on github um it has to be available for people so we work with amazing with amazing design george lupi alberto caro is kind of our consultant art director works with us all the time on some of these projects um and the idea is again when we're doing this stuff to just make it fun but really kind of work well on any platforms this is something that uh, george lupi and accurate did for us around the 2016 election showing the issues that people search for with each candidate in different countries around the world um moritz looked at the way people search for food and he wanted to show dates and and months and years on a single chart which is kind of beautiful they are beautiful and it has has and because it's about food it has the advantage that some of the charts actually looked like food which is uh causes cool. search for donuts the like filter fish and the pear is like one of my favorites down here that wasn't intentional this is just like the data reflecting reflecting art the other thing we think a lot about is is that innovation side of it how can we make it innovative and how can we open that up so we did this visual around brexit looking at the countries uh around europe and what they were searching what questions were they asking about brexit for the vote for it happened I thought well this is kind of quite 3d-ish what if we made it into a vr visualization what would that look like so we had a sprint we had a two week sprint i've never made anything in vr before so we had a two week sprint uh with pitch interactive um in oakland and we made this chart where you look around and you can see uh what countries in the world and how they um how they were searching for brexit there were some some rules that were really important that we understood that we've learned for instance you can't present people with a ton of information the way that you could on a desktop interactive because it's too much if it's like this you can't read anything the other thing is you can actually make people physically sick with a data viz it's great you can make people physically sick so you had to give them a floor to stand on otherwise when you look down there's nothing people actually feel kind of woozy and there's a whole there's actually a whole set of um of tools now for stopping people feeling feeling sick around around um VR so we actually, so when we did this we open sourced it we also wrote a big kind of instruction manual this is how we did this to make it easier for people to to understand we've also got some more templates on flourish now we started adding vr templates to flourish to try and make it easy for people to use so this is one around tv shows it's basically it's a network chart showing if you search for one show what else do you search for and um I've, I've, I've got a better uh, screen now but it's worth checking out so the idea is you can make you can go to flourish you can make a vr visualization now this is something which we've just launched it's looking at ar how can we how do you represent data in an augmented reality environment it's not easy so um we work with georgia lupi and accurate to show um to our people to come make a visualization and then you can you, you can create this uh, little statue which is made up of rocks that you size 
um, basically based on how hopeful you are for something. And then when you click on them, it shows this data around you. It's kind of a beautiful thing. It's now open source. It's almost to show what's possible. Um, and this is uh, in the experimental mode. This is something else we did with um, uh, Datavised in New York. And the idea was to look at generative art. Generative art is kind of something that's really hard to make. How do you make things from data that don't just look like a bar chart or a pie chart? Is there, are there other ways to represent that data? So we come up with this tool called Morph, and that's the link to it. And we can use it. You can upload data set and create something beautiful. And maybe it's just something beautiful and something pretty and doesn't tell you anything useful about data. Or maybe it's a new way of representing it. It's a way for people to experiment and muck around. But as things are becoming more sophisticated, things are also becoming simpler. Data GIFs, a real example, you know, people are using data now, a GIFs now as a way to represent data because they're shareable. Like, for instance, Vox. Vox has no interactives because no, they, they just don't work on mobile. And you can't guarantee they're going to work on these mobiles. GIFs and images do work. So, and there are loads of examples now of people using GIFs in really kind of sophisticated ways. Um, we have a thing called Data GIF Maker, which um, we're going to relaunch before the end of the year. And it's a way to make GIFs, animated GIFs, from, from just really simple, small data sets. The other thing that's really important, and I know I'm kind of brushing up on time, aren't I? We okay? We did start a bit later, didn't we? So, I think it's really important is now I think there was a period when Enjoying data visualization meant kind of being quite sober faced about it. Actually, having, having fun with visualization is a really important thing because you want it to be accessible. You want people to understand it. And we thought really, really hard about this, about how to make visualizations fun and interesting. This is something that Nadia Bremer did for us. And what she wants to look at were the top words that people searched for to translate into English. And we decided to keep all, all the words in. So often they're kind of boring. Things like working or Wednesday. Wednesday, weirdly, comes up in many languages as a thing people try and translate into English. Um, but beautiful, beautiful came up as one of the top words, and I love that. These are the things that, that, that kind of unite us when right? we people search. This is something that um, we did around. We noticed there was a spike for people searching for how to fix stuff. That's really, really increased in the last few years, and it's, you know, it's what I do. We all do this, right? And we noticed there were kind of differences in the way that people search around how to fix things. So as you can see, these pink dots represent the global average of people searching for how to fix something. So in the United States, we're fine with washing machines, um, but doors obviously cause us problems. And light bulbs, look at how big that light bulb is compared to the global average. And a little bit toilets as well. Whereas in France, in France, washing machines are a big problem. And um, this can't see this down here is electrical outlets, um, but they're fine with light bulbs. Um, but then if you look at the work of someone like Mona, Mona Chalby, of her work is really just these hand-drawn beautiful illustrations that are fun, but often dealing with really difficult things. So I think this, you know, this idea that all data visualization has to be the sober exercise of, of restraint. I think you know, there is an argument about being restrained in the way you visualize data, but I think trying to represent it in fun, exciting ways that are accessible is really important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about memory, and then I'm going to stop. If, that's tight, if anybody's got any questions, we can talk about them. And one of the things that's really important, I think, is that there's a history here. Data journalism didn't just bless you. Data journalism didn't just start in 2009. There's been people doing things in interesting ways for a, a number of years. Um, this is a guy called Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune. New York Tribune did this amazing exercise in, um, in leaked uh, congressional expenses, which got Abraham Lincoln into trouble. It's an incredible piece of work. That actually, you know, you could uh, do, use some of those techniques now. And we know who this is. This is not a journalist, but his work is very important. Okay, this is a guy called John Snow, who was an anaesthetist in the UK, and uh, there was a cholera outbreak in London, and um, they they didn't know what caused cholera in those days. They thought it was caused by kind of miasma in the air. So he thought, oh, let's, let's map it. He made this map of deaths from cholera. And they know so all around here, these little bars are deaths. And that is a water pump. So thanks to him, we, we discovered that how cholera was, was spread. And it turned out the water pump was over a cesspit that people had been throwing babies kind of diapers in. And people were drinking that, which is, uh, uh, is, is kind of revolting. But it would have had the effect if it was a table of data. I don't think so. It's the fact that it's a map, then people can see it and understand it. 
Do we know who this is? Florence Nightingale. Hey, Florence Nightingale. Lady of the Lamp, also obsessed with numbers and data. Um, she did a report on the conditions in the British Army, which found that more people died from uh, preventable diseases than from being shot or killed or in, in action, essentially. Um, and that's what this chart, this chart shows. So again, using, using visualizations to make that data understandable and have an impact. This is uh, Minard, who produced the, the, you know, the, the, the most lo beloved Victorian, um, Victorian data visualization at any time. Has anybody seen this before? A few, few of you have, yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? The retreat from Moscow, the, the march on the retreat from Moscow. That's the French army then, and that's then when they returned. And then we've got William Playfair. William Playfair was an amazing guy, he was an economist. He also took part in the storming of the Bastille, which is not normal for economists. He invented the bar chart and the pie chart and the line chart. There's a history here, is what I'm saying. And it's important. It even goes to the 70s. Phil Meyer, Phil Meyer wrote Precision Journalism, still one of the best books about the field. He also was responsible for the Detroit Project, which was really using kind of journalistic techniques to go into after the Detroit riots to really try and understand this stuff better. And, and without that work, I was going to talk about this, but I won't. I'm going to shoot through this a little bit. Um, you know, we wouldn't, when I was guarding, we wouldn't be able to do this piece on the, the London riots where we took crime records and we matched them up with poverty and we looked at people's travel routes and the spread of rumours on social media. And that was all because Phil Meyer had already done this stuff, that we were able to do that stuff. There's a, there's a link, an institutional memory link. But at the same time, we have a crisis at the moment and a lot of data journalism is disappearing, it's vanishing. Because digital disappears, when people build work, the libraries change, stuff just stops working. All these projects are part of data journalism history and none of them work now. This is MP's expenses that I was involved in. You can't see that now, there's nowhere to see that stuff. It's gone. And um, without memory, we can't learn anything. If we're always reinventing stuff, we're never going to, have to learn anything. So I'm going to finish with this guy. This is James Cameron. Um, who was uh, not the director of Aliens or Avatar. He's a British reporter in the 1560s in Vietnam and Korea. And um, he has said, he's done amazing, his work is still worth watching. You can find a lot of it on YouTube now. New world, he said this, New World will be a place of answering questions, no questions, because the only questions left will be answered by computers, because only computers will know what to ask. He probably wouldn't be a fan of data now. However, I think there is something to that, that we're able to tell stories in incredible ways now because of the technology that we have, because of the power um, that we have of, of, of bringing those numbers to life. But this, the root of it, that, that mission of journalism has not changed. It's all about telling stories in the best possible way. So thank you. Thanks for having me. And um, I know it's late and I'm keeping you off from your dinner.